Well, good morning, Golden Hills. Thank you for coming out to worship the Lord with us this morning. You know, today kicks off our brand new series in Hosea, and we're, we're going to uh, rediscover uh, the unceasing love of a father towards uh, an unfaithful people like us. And uh, we're grateful to celebrate and be reminded of this grace that he has extended to us this morning. So let me pray for us, then we'll have a chance to stand together and to sing of these truths today. Father in heaven, thank you for this morning. God, the fact that we can gather here in this place to sing of these truths, to be reminded, God, of your unquenching love that never fails and it never tires and never runs out. It is steadfast and sure. And we are a grateful people this morning to be able to experience this and to enjoy you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing this out. Grace alone. So I'll stand in faith. 
Good morning, my name is Jim Ayala. I'm one of the elders here at Golden Hills. Our scripture reading today is found in the book of 1 Peter, chapters two, verses nine and 10. Hear the word of the Lord. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in praying for our offering? Lord, you have graciously poured your love and mercy upon your church, we call Golden Hills. We pray that this offering will be reflective of our thanks to you for our many blessings that you have given. We pray that our giving will demonstrate that we, as a congregation, are in fact God's people. By the fact that we give thankfully with cheerful hearts. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing this out.
coming. <laughs> Father, we do just give you such praise and thanks for who you are. God, we give you such praise and thanks for all that you've done for us. God, as we think about the reality of your presence, that you never leave us nor forsake us, and even in the darkest times, even in the hardest times, when we suffer, when we weep, when there's great and immense sorrow, you don't abandon us, but you are there. And we know from the scriptures, Lord, that you, whether by sending it or allowing it, these hardships are gonna work for our good and for your glory. And God, in that kind of mindset, we think of the many people in our church, many people in our communities, many people that we know of who are sick. Well, we can tell that it's affecting many people even just because less and less people are gathering with us, less and less people showing up various places. So we ask that you'd watch over their bodies, you'd grant healing. God, that you would watch over the families, that there be no grave and serious illness. We pray that you would heal in such a way that there'd be swift recovery, no lingering, no long, effects. 
And God, you would watch over us that our sicknesses will not hinder what it is you've called us to do. So we lay before you the countless people we know who are sick and ailing. We lay before you many people in our community and we ask God that you would touch them, heal them, watch over them, protect them. And Father, we count it a privilege and a joy to intercede on behalf of our church and one another and to intercede on behalf of our community and our nation and the world at large. And we see, Lord, there's a great need for you to intervene and to bring about redemption, to bring about truth. And we ask God that you would indeed do that. We pray that you would lead us and you would provide for others wisdom, that you would grant mercy. And God, as we lay before you um, all that is in our lives, whether it's work or family or pleasure, whatever it may be, Lord, help us as we lay these things before you prayerfully to have an eye towards your glory, that in all things we would do it for the praise of your name. And God, as we gather in this place now, beginning this series in Hosea, where we're gonna read about your mercy, but we're also gonna read about your holiness. We're gonna read about your justice. We're gonna read about how you are the God of steadfast love. Would you illumine our minds and hearts, expanding our understanding of who you are, that we may come to a fuller and deeper and richer relationship with you. So God, would you be pleased to use your word by your spirit to inflame in our hearts a passion for you, that we would think clearly and critically about who you are and what that entails for our lives. God, may you cause within us to be a changed people for what we read and what we hear. May we never be the same again for having studied the book of Hosea. But instead, may we emerge as a church more and more in the image of Christ than when we first began. God, we look to you to do these things. We know that you can. We know that you're willing. And so, God, we are grateful to ask for these prayers and supplications and requests. You hear them, and we trust that you will work in and through them. So be for us, do for us, work in us all that we need for your glory and our joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ah, good morning, everyone. Oh, by the way, you could be seated if you want. It'd be really weird for you to keep standing. Um, my name is Phil. I'm one of the pastors here at Golden Hills, and uh, if you're new to our church or just visiting, I do want to say welcome. So glad that you're here. Uh, if you happen to have any questions or want to know more about our church, we'd be more than happy uh, to answer those questions to provide anything that you may need. So uh, we encourage you to visit our website at goldenhills.org. Um, we have some people around who would love to talk with you and answer whatever questions you may have. Um, there's a QR code when you walk in, a little sign. You can take a picture of it, get our bulletin, get the sermon outline and various announcements and whatnot, and just familiarize yourself with our church. And those of you who've been here for a while, you know uh, we uh, re, um, revamped our website, and so I want to encourage you to, to visit that. Um, we'll be launching or releasing our, our updated app pretty soon just to be more and more in communication with everyone, and we want to make sure that you are uh, aware of those things. A couple of things that you should, be, uh, that you should know about. One is um, for the parents, and I guess kids too, of middle school and high school kids going to, to winter camp, you need to remember that today's the day where you need to turn in your final payment, so make sure that you don't neglect to do that. Uh, today at two o'clock, just in a couple hours, we're going to gather together as the members of Golden Hills to have our annual business meeting where we're gonna be electing and ratifying elders and deacons. We're gonna be voting on our budget. We're gonna hear about uh, things that the Lord is doing in our church and get an update on some other projects and things that we've been uh, kind of working towards for a while now. So uh, again, uh, Caring Hands is available. If you need it, just call the office and we'll be able to accommodate that. Um, but lots of stuff happening. And uh, again, if you're not a member of our church, we'd love for you to come anyway. Just get a, get a listen on what's going on. We have nothing to hide. Love being transparent. Um, question and answer times. So all, that, all that stuff is really good. So uh, I just want to let you know about that. And then today marks the beginning of a whole bunch of winter classes that we have started. Too many for me to name. Uh, but um, we have some great classes starting. And uh, if you, you know, are looking to grow, supplement your discipleship, uh, these classes will be fantastic. So, I want to invite you uh, to find your way in your copy of God's Word to the book of Hosea, the book of Hosea. Now, when I was a middle school pastor, believe it or not, I used to pastor middle school kids, um, 
And then people realized I'm not very good at that, so they had me do other things. But anyways, the, what I would do was I would tell the middle school kids, was like, take your Bible and crack it in half, and more than likely you're gonna uh, land somewhere in the Psalms or the Proverbs. And I want you to make a right-hand turn and make your way past Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel, and the very next book will be Hosea. And you can navigate your way there. You know, one of the things, uh, as you navigate your way there, one of the things that I've noticed about our culture, and you know this as well, um, maybe you haven't explicitly thought about it, but we as Americans, we really love the rags to riches story. You know what I'm talking about? It's that story of the person who's down and out, who's poor, who has nothing, and then all of a sudden, because of, I don't know, determination and hard work, they rise to wealth and power and we love these stories, we wanna be like these people, we, wanna, we admire them and we want to be determined like they are and we want to experience success like them and we love these stories so much that we've actually adopted this story and we superimpose it on the story of the Bible where we have this notion in our minds that we all are like poor people, uh, you know, we're just, we're down and out and you know, we just haven't been given a couple advantages that we really need but you know what, if we just, have a little self-respect and some dignity. You know, we can pull ourselves up. We can, you know, we can get our life in order. And how we can do that, you know, come to Jesus, give Jesus a little bit of a try, see how it goes. And when people do that and they find, you know what, it actually is a little bit better. And then pretty soon it's like, you know what, this is really working. Life is just peaches. Um, Couldn't be better. This is awesome. And we think about the Christian story in terms of the rags to riches story, we have to realize that who emerges as the hero is not Jesus, it's you. You're the one that was down and out on your luck and you're the one that had enough self-respect and enough, I don't know, dignity to say, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore and you're the one that sought out Jesus and found him and you're the one that implemented everything and you're the one that kind of made the most out of your opportunity and doggone it. You're a pretty good dude. Jesus just plays a supporting actor role in that story. He's a means to an end. He is not the purpose. He is not the one who is the focus. But as we come to the Bible, what we see in the story of the Bible is not about a people who pull them up pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and heroically change their lives and become successful. We see a people obstinate disobedient, wayward, hating God, belittling God, wanting nothing to do with God. And at the same time, we encounter a God who in spite of all of this resistance, a God who overcomes our resistance and relentlessly pursues a wayward people anyway. We don't have what it takes. We can't pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Instead, we have to throw ourselves upon the mercy and grace of God. And we encounter in the Bible this story that while we were helpless and could do nothing, God came and did everything necessary to pull us out of the muck and mire and to set us in a place of honor. And he did so through his son, Jesus Christ. And in that story, God gets all the glory. And Jesus gets all the focus. And in the book of Hosea, we're gonna encounter that exact story time and time again. It starts today in Hosea 1, where we see a wayward, obstinate, disobedient, unfaithful people who want nothing to do with God, and yet there's God in his mercy and grace pursuing these very people who don't want him, love him, or want anything to do with him. God still pursues, loves, gives mercy and grace. In fact, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Hosea 6 really fast, this, these two verses kind of help us understand how to navigate the book of Hosea and how to understand it as it unfolds before us. There Hosea writes this, come, come let us return to the Lord for he has torn us so that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us and on the third day, he will raise us up so that we may live before him. That's resurrection language. That's the language of, you know what? This is the gospel. 
that what God does is he intends to expose us of our need. He wants us to be realistic of who we are and he's going to force us to face the facts that we are sinful. We are wayward. We are rotten to the core. We are sinners. We rebel against God. And all the day long, we want nothing to do with God. And we need to face that reality and order that as we face the reality, wounded as we may be because of that reality, because when you feel the reality that you are wicked and you are undeserving of anything but hell, that doesn't feel good. It makes you feel like, oh man, for real? But when we read Hosea 6, we realize, no, he wounds us to bind us. He tears us down in order to build us up. And it's until we realize our own neediness and sinfulness and waywardness and rebellion and obstinance, we won't ever revel in the glories of God's grace. God wants to expose our need for him and he wants to exalt us by showing his grace, but you gotta have both. Because if you only talk about the glories of God's grace, that's not good news, because you don't know what the good news is good for. And if you only talk about judgment, there's no good news, it's only bad news. And the only way to truly preach Christ, the only way to understand the gospel is to understand it's like a meat fork. It has two prongs, so you can flip over your tri-tip. Because if you stab a meat fork and it only has one prong, it's a skewer and that thing just spins. <laughs> but the gospel needs to wound and it binds. And that's what we see in the book of Hosea. It's a story of how God is so committed to his people and remains faithful to his covenant that even through his judgment, he shows his mercy. So here's how, here's what we read in Hosea 1. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, and by the way, anytime you see L-O-R-D all in uh, small caps, that's God's personal name, Yahweh. That means there's a personal relationship there. So Yahweh, the Lord says to Hosea, go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblium, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, call her name no mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah. And I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. And when she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, call his name, not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Now what I need to do is this, and I'm gonna give you like a heads up, this is a disclaimer. Most of you have no idea what's going on in this text. You don't know who Jehu is, you don't know what Jezreel is, you don't know what uh, Lo Ami means or Lo Ruhama, you don't understand probably the importance of going up out of the land and all this kind of stuff. And that's because we are so far removed to the time in which this takes place, right around 730 BC, that the geography, topography, just kind of the cultural stuff that's going on and the historical background of Hosea is lost to us. We have no idea what's going on here. 
So my responsibility is this. I need to make this intelligible. I need for us to understand what's happening here. But in order to do that, I need to bring the historical background to us that we may understand it rightly and properly. If I don't, then I'm just making it up. And uh, that's not good when teachers just make stuff up. So I'm gonna ask you to listen. And I'm gonna ask you, as boring as it may be for the next 10 to 15 minutes, listen. Because this is gonna unpack the book of Hosea for us and the things that we talk about today will, in effect, uh, have ramifications for how we read other chapters throughout the book of Hosea. We published a little study guide that was available, I think it was 700, 800 copies of it. We just sold out this morning. But we had a little study guide that we encouraged people to get. You can still get it on Amazon, just type in Golden Hills Community Church, Hosea, and it'll be there. You can get it for Kindle and all that kind of stuff. And we have a free PDF that you can get as well. That'll be on our website later today. And so you can kind of see that. It won't be pretty and it's big paper anyways, but you can get access to it. There's information in there that will not be in what I'm preaching on. And I'm just assuming that you'll take the liberty and uh, you'll read on it and you'll study it and that kind of thing. So that way I can just assume those things and continue on. But I have to kind of set the historical background of what's going on in Hosea for us to understand what's going on for the whole book. All right, having said that, you know they teach you in preaching class. I never took a preaching class, but um, I've watched videos on preaching classes. Anyways, they, they say never give a disclaimer and especially never tell your audience that what you're about to say is boring. So I did both, uh, just for kicks and giggles. So here it is. I'm gonna do this little thing for the next 10 minutes or so, give us a little background. And what I'm gonna do is just tell you the history from Genesis until Hosea, just in a few minutes. Here's how it works. You already know Genesis, you know God created everything, you know that there was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob eventually has his name changed to Israel. Israel then has 12 sons. These 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. And one of the sons named Joseph makes his way to Egypt because he is sold by his brothers. And while he's in Egypt, miracle upon miracle, he rises to the number two most powerful person in all of Egypt. And God giving him the wisdom that he had was able to position Egypt into a place where they had worldwide kind of prominence. And eventually, Joseph revealed himself to his brothers and brought his brothers and family to Egypt to live underneath him uh, and, you know, to be secure and whatnot. Over the course of 400 years, the nation of Egypt, or the nation of Israel was in Egypt and they began to populate and multiply. And during that time, they, become, they became enslaved. The nation of Egypt was threatened by the multiplication of the Israelites and then put more and more bondage on them, requiring them to do all kinds of manual labor to the point where the people began to cry out to God to save them and help them. And the Lord heard their, their, their prayers and their cries and he raised up a man named Moses. Moses was then gonna lead the nation of Israel out of the land of Egypt and he did so through many different miracles, leading them to the Red Sea, if you recall. And at the Red Sea, they were stopped and everyone was terrified, but God once again provided another miracle. And in that miracle, it's called the Great Redemption, where God redeemed his people out of Egypt. And they crossed the Red Sea and went into the desert area, the wilderness, and then the waters uh, covered the Egyptian army, which was pursuing them. And as they were heading to the Promised Land, they finally get to the Promised Land and they get to the edge of it and two spies are sent out to see how well the land would suit them. And they come back and give a great report, but the people are still shaking at the, the reality that if they go to war, they may not have what it takes to conquer, even, if, even though God said you do. They didn't believe God. And so they continue to resist and wait in. And then Moses makes his fatal error where he doesn't trust God about a water source. And God says, Moses, you're not gonna enter the promised land. Instead, you're gonna die and your people are gonna wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And so for 40 years, they did wander. And it says that their sandals did not give out and God provided them food and everything they needed until finally Moses died and then comes Joshua. Joshua becomes the leader of the nation of Israel. He's empowered. He's told not to fear, but be strong for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And he tells the people to consecrate themselves, to make themselves holy and be prepared for a great day. In Joshua chapter three, 
We see the nation getting to the edge of the Jordan River and just like the crossing of the Red Sea, they pray and the priests go into the water and the waters of the Jordan River stop and all the people go into the promised land on dry land. And through the leadership of Joshua, he was able to conquer many of the peoples in the land to which God promised his people as an inheritance. And they disposed the people who were in the land and they began to settle there according to the allotment that God gave the nation of Israel. Some tribes would take the north and some would take the south and the central and the east and whatnot. And you can read about that allotment in Joshua in the beginning of Judges. And as the people began to settle in the promised land, they started to have some issues. Namely, some peoples like the Philistines, Amalekites, Amorites, Jebusites, they began to attack the nation of Israel and they began to attack the people. And so the people began to be scared. And they began to cry out to God, God, help us, God, save us. You brought us here, can't you protect us? And the Lord, hearing their cries, hearing their prayers, did provide for them deliverers who are called judges. And you can read about them in the book of Judges. And throughout this time, they were a confederacy of tribes. They didn't have a central government. They were kind of self-ruled according to their tribes, their leaders. And over time, the people realized, you know what, we are susceptible to invasion. And they looked at the nations around them and they said, you know what, we wanna be like the other nations. We wanna have a solid central government that will watch over us and protect us. And so they rejected God's way of being king over them and they asked for a human king instead. And in being rejected, God says, you know what, if you want this, I'll give it to you, but you better be warned. When this king gets placed, he's gonna take stuff from you and you're not gonna like it. They wanted it anyways. So they asked for a king and God gave the king Saul to the nation of Israel. And he was qualified because he was tall and handsome. As we all understand, that's, that's generally what we do. If you, if you, you know, you're good looking and you, know, you look like you're something, then you are something. And so he becomes king, and he does okay for a little while, but after a while, he begins to trust in himself and his own power and his own abilities until finally God says, we've had enough. You are disobedient. You're not listening to me. So God disposes of King Saul and raises up this shepherd boy named David. King David comes to the throne as just this poor shepherd boy who really didn't have much to offer. And that's exactly what God wanted because God does not judge by outward appearances, but God judges the heart. And he sees in the heart of David that this is a man after God's own heart. He's a warrior, so he's able to defend his people. He's a military strategist. But not only that, he is a man who is in touch with the Lord, his feelings. I know it's just crazy. But he's a man in touch with his feelings, evidenced by the fact that he writes such beautiful poetry and music. You can read about it in the book of Psalms. And as you continue to understand the history of this, you can read about it in 1 Samuel. David does really well for a really long time, and then he has some major, major issues. Entering into 2 Samuel, you begin to see the demise of David's leadership until eventually God says, enough's enough. I'm actually gonna be done with you, and your son Solomon is going to reign in your place. David dies. Solomon comes to reign, and he is ruling as a wise king. But as wise as he is, he's still pretty stupid because he's able to judge different scenarios, but he's not smart enough to know that if you marry a bunch of women, it's gonna be a challenge. (laughs) And not only that, but if you're gonna worship God and you're also going to adopt some other gods, that things aren't gonna be really good. So he led and was a king in a half-hearted kind of way. And then Solomon, Uh, because of his various sins, was told that his kingdom was gonna be torn from him and was gonna be divided in two. There would be 10 tribes that would go to the north. They would be called the nation of Israel. They would also be called Ephraim. That is because the largest tribe in the north was Ephraim. Or they would be called Samaria because the capital of the northern kingdom was called Samaria. And the northern kingdom would have a king and that king's name is Jeroboam who was one of the officers in Solomon's court. But the southern kingdom, since 10 go north, then two tribes will go south. And that kingdom would be called the kingdom of Judah. And they would have a king named Rehoboam. And Rehoboam was the direct son of Solomon. The capital would be in Jerusalem. And so sometimes Judah would be called, you know, uh, Zion or Jerusalem or Judah. Now the northern kingdom of 10 tribes and the southern kingdom of Judah with two tribes worked together from time to time, but a lot of time they were at odds with each other. 
And it came to blows from time to time where there would be great wars that would happen. But along the way, there was situations outside of Israel that began to produce a, a real sense of prosperity. The kingdom divided in about 930 BC and the book of Hosea is written in about 730 BC. So about 200 years has transpired. In the northern kingdom, most of the kings are evil and did, did wicked stuff. And God re- uh, reminded them or, or told them repeatedly, you gotta stop this stuff. You gotta repent. You, got, you can't keep doing this. But they kept at it. Now, in the southern kingdom, they actually had a mixture of some good kings and some bad kings, and so the Lord was more patient with them. Until we get to the point where the the power of Egypt and the power of Assyria, so if you notice, just, just picture with me, you have the nation of Israel here, Israel to the top, Judah to the south, Assyria is on the north, and they're always pinching in with their military power. And then from the south comes Egypt, and they're always pushing in from the south. But during the 800s, during that century, the leadership of Egypt and Assyria began to wane. They lost some battles. There was a lot of turmoil and turnover in their leadership. And so Judah and Israel were able to be a little more free. And in that freedom, they were able to develop their economy. They were ever able to develop, uh, develop their military. They were able to expand their international trading routes. And part of the reason why they were able to do that is because in the south, They were led by a man named Uzziah who reigned for 52 years. In the north, they were led by a man named Jeroboam II who reigned for 41 years. They had a sense of kind of stability. And in that stability, that was why they were able to prosper. While the nations outside of Israel had instability and they weren't able to prosper as well. Now during this prosperous time, there was also an economic Um, and political and military kind of expansion. And the people were experiencing, because of this great, uh, you know, influx of wealth, they were experiencing this kind of taste for urban life. They liked the idea of being able to do things in an urban environment, and they were going less and less, they were were leaving more and more from the, the, you know, the farming communities more into the urbanization. And as the urbanization increased, injustices and poverty also increased. And the people who are getting most wealthy are those who are rulers. It was the kings, the princes, and the people like that. They started to see that, you know what, the fertile lands that God has given us is producing great crops, and now we're able to, because of our infrastructure, we're able to sell these products on these international trading routes, and we're able to get a lot of money. And they started to look at who owned the fertile land and they started to say, you know, these people, they're weak, we're strong. And they would just come and commandeer and take the land. Then they began to work it themselves or they would hire out these workers to produce all the crops that these rich people then would go and sell and get more and more rich. And so they would get richer on the backs of the poor. And God didn't like this very much. In fact, Isaiah chapter three talks about this very thing. The Lord has taken his place to contend. He stands to judge peoples. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders and the princes of his people. Why? Why is God going to contend and judge these people? It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. Meaning you have nice stuff in your house only because you robbed the poor. And what do you mean by crushing my people? By grinding the face of the poor. You are humiliating these people, you are dishonoring them, and by doing so, you're dishonoring me, God says. And I won't stand for it any longer. I will not allow you to continue to prosper on the backs of the poor. I will come and I will judge you. And so that serves as chapter one, verse one, the background of what's going on there. And we come to verse two then, where God is gonna tell Hosea to do a strange thing for a strange reason. He speaks to Hosea and says, go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, and for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. In other words, Hosea is told that he will become a living metaphor that represents the relationship between God and his people. In other words, God says, I am like a husband and my people are like a whore. 
They are sexually promiscuous. They are prostituting themselves. And the language here is so like rated R kind of stuff. I had people actually email me, are you really gonna read this? Yes. (laughs) The nation of Israel was like a spiritual adulteress. It's graphic. It's as though the wife on her wedding night leaves her marriage bed and goes down to the corner and sells herself out that very night. He's just like, whoa. But that's the language that God is using here. Not only you, Israel, but your children, which means you are discipling your children into how to be more and more spiritually adulterous. You are teaching them how to ignore me. You are teaching them how to belittle me. You are teaching them how to be disobedient to me. And not only that, but the land that I have given you to be a blessing to you, you are using it for your own purposes. You're not using it in the way that I gave it to you to use. And so, God is saying, I'm gonna judge you. I'm gonna judge you for your personal spiritual adultery. I'm going to judge you because you are teaching your children how to be spiritually adulterous. And I am going to judge you because you are not using my gifts the way I intend them to be used. And so not only Hosea and Gomer, his wife, not only will they be a metaphor for this relationship between God and his people, but also his children will be a metaphor of the relationship between God and his people. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna look at verses four through nine, and we're gonna see these three children with the weirdest names you can imagine. And these weird named kids are gonna serve as an example of what God is trying to communicate about his relationship with his people. We'll begin with the first child whose name is Jezreel. And the Lord said to Hosea, call his name Jezreel. For in just a little while, I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel. And I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And we need to ask ourselves, what in the world is going on here? Who is Jezreel and why is this significant? The word Jezreel here means God sows. It's the idea that you take seed and you sow it into the ground and eventually it will produce something fruitful. And so this land of Jezreel is a valley. And uh, in 2019, a bunch of us went to Israel and Lord willing in 2022, sometime in November, we're, a group of us are gonna go back to Israel and there's a place called the Valley of Jezreel that we actually go and visit. It's not a very big valley. You can drive across it in like three to five minutes. It's, like, it's not like the Sacramento Valley at all. It's very small. But it's more popularly known, and you would probably know it for this reason, it's, it's also known as the Valley of Armageddon. And of course, I'm like, oh, Armageddon, yeah, I know about, no, you don't. <laughs> we have embellished uh, the biblical um, understanding of Jezreel and the Valley of Jezreel and, and uh, you see some crazy movies left behind nonsense where um, in fictional form it's trying to communicate theology and it's just deceiving people left and right. Um, and, and it's this idea that there's gonna be trillions upon trillions of people doing battle in this little valley. And you're like, <laughs> if you've been there, you'll see like, oh, I can see the other side of the, like it's right there, that's the, mm. I'm not sure that more than like A half a million people can fit in this valley. Honestly, it's not that big. But trillions? Okay. But what's interesting is Megiddo, the city, is on a hilltop and you can oversee the valley of Jezreel. And there's a little city called Jezreel. And what's interesting is if you ever want to travel from the north to the south or from the south to the north and you don't want to climb mountains and hills, then you go through the valley of Jezreel. It's the gateway to go from north to south through the land of Israel. Which means anytime Egypt wanted to attack or any time Assyria from the north wanted to attack, guess which, which route they went. That's right, they went to the land in the Valley of Jezreel. And because there were so many battles that were fought in Jezreel, and so many hundreds of thousands of people who lost their lives, blood was everywhere in the Valley of Jezreel, it became a byword. It became kind of one of those things that's just kind of known for how nasty it was the Valley of Jezreel, or the Valley of Megiddo. It symbolizes blood, judgment, and battle. So think of it like this. Uh, we all know uh, Watergate, right? In the 1960s, 70s, you understand Watergate kind of scandal. Do you notice that every scandal after that now has gate at the end? I watched the 49ers game last night, woo And um, I hope they play 
the Buccaneers so that way we can beat Tom Brady. But because I, <laughs> I just don't like Tom Brady, the football player. So why don't I like him? Because of Deflate Gate. You remember that? Or uh, I don't know, Spy Gate, where there video. Anyways, Gate. Whenever you say Spy Gate or Deflate Gate, what you're saying is there was a conspiracy, there was something going on. The same thing with Jezreel, something's going on. This is a bloody place. Now, what makes it so bloody, uh, I want to point this out. You can read about it in 2 Kings 9 and 10. There was this evil king named Ahab. I'm talking about Moby Dick. I'm talking about uh, King Ahab uh, in, in the Bible. And he was married to this nasty old woman named Jezebel. Now, we know she's so bad that we don't even name our children Je- Jezebel, right? We're like, mm, I'm not touching that. But she was wicked. He was wicked. And so they were so wicked, God says, I'm going to judge you and you're going you're to die because of your wickedness. And so in the city of Jezreel, a man came to be the king of Israel whose name was Jehu. And God told Jehu that he was going to enact the punishment on Ahab and Jezebel and their family. And so he hacked up and killed all the descendants of Ahab, Jehu did. And there was great bloodshed in the city of Jezreel. Not only that, but later on, Jehu comes to the city of Jezreel, and he comes to the place where Jezebel is up in her second or third story tower, and she leans out the window and says, what do you want? And he says, I'm going to kill you, loosely translated. And so he sees up in the window that there's uh, uh, some servants there, and she basically defies him. And so Jehu says to the servants, throw her out the window. And they throw her out the window. She hits the ground, her blood splatters all over the wall, and it scares the horses, and the horses begin to trample her. And then later on, dogs come and eat the rest of her body. (laughs) So so now go back to verse 4. I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel. Now you're starting to get a glimpse of just how bloody and disgusting Jezreel is, the valley and also the city. And what God is saying is, Jehu, you did a good thing in doing what I asked you to do, but he went far beyond that, and he began to live a sinful life. And so he's saying, look, the same blood that you shed is going to come back on your head. And then he goes on to say this, and I'm going to put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. I'm going to be done with Israel. I'm going to be done with the northern kingdom. Because not only was the Valley of Jezreel a place of great blood, but it was a fertile valley. And if you go there even today, you can look it up, Google it, Valley of Jezreel, and you'll see just farms everywhere. Beautiful. You can just tell the soil is rich. And that was how they got their wealth, was that was, that was the land that they were farming. So much so that if you go to 1 Kings chapter 21, you're going to read about a guy named Naboth. Now, Naboth Uh, owns this little plot of land kind of next door to this military fortress that King Ahab had. And what was interesting is Naboth was really prosperous because his land was so fertile that King Ahab looked at the prosperity of Naboth and he was like, I want that. And so he goes down to Naboth and he says, can I buy your property? And Naboth says, no, you can't buy my property because that would be against the law in Leviticus chapter 25 verse 23, which is to say you're not allowed to sell your property. It's an inheritance. You have to keep it. So Ahab throws a fit. He goes home, and his wife's like, what's wrong with you? He's like, Naboth won't sell me the the property. And she's like, oh, really? So she puts together a plan to knock off Naboth by hiring two worthless guys who are going to lie about Naboth, that he blasphemed the Lord, and then they're going to stone him to death. That's exactly what happens. They have a dinner. Naboth is taken outside. These two worthless liars are like, he's blaspheming the Lord. And they stoned him to death and his blood was shed right there in Jezreel. And then Jezebel finishes that, comes back to Ahab and says, the land is yours. And he's like, really? And he goes downstairs and he takes ownership of the land and begins to farm it. That's the kind of sinfulness and evil injustice that is happening where there's lots of bloodshed. Jezreel not only was a fertile valley, not only was a place of bloodshed, but it was a place of, of a strong military outpost. And so if you put these all together, you would say the valley of Jezreel is a reason for the nation of Israel to be proud. Not in a good proud, but in a bad proud. In the sense they're like this, um, we're wealthy, we're powerful, we're protected, 
we're safe. What do we need God for? And God's saying, well, because of that attitude, I'm done with you. I'm gonna put an end to this kingdom. And he says in verse five, on that day I will break the bow, that is the military bow, the military strength. I'm gonna break the military strength of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. It's gonna happen right here. You're gonna be done. So that is child number one. Child number two uh, has an even stranger name. Uh, can you imagine calling your kids Jez- like Jezreel, You're just like, hey, bloodshed. You know? The second child, even worse, um, it's a daughter, verse six, and Hosea is to call her name No Mercy. Another way to say that is uh, God doesn't love you anymore. (laughs) And can you imagine this? You name your kid, hey, God doesn't love you anymore. You're just strolling through Target shopping and you're like, where'd he go? Hey, God doesn't love you anymore. Where are you? It's like, what? That's messed up. That kid's gonna need counseling. And so here is no mercy, and God says, name this child no mercy because I will have no more mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. (laughs) None. You want mercy? Too bad. You want to be forgiven? Mm Mm-mm, not going to happen. I'm done with you. Now, this is shocking to us because as you read in Exodus 34, God, whose name is Yahweh, he reveals himself to be a God of mercy. He passes before Moses, and this is what happens. He proclaims Yahweh, Yahweh. In other words, Moses, this is who I am. This is the essence of who God is. He says, I am Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. You see, God is very clear about this. There are consequences for sin. He will by no means clear the guilty. You can't just ignore sin. God's gonna have consequences for sin, but at the same time, God reveals himself as being merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity. And so you ask yourself the question, how is the God who's revealed himself in Exodus 34, now the God who says, you want mercy? Nope. You get nothing. One reason why Israel does not receive mercy is because, as I've already said, it has grown self-reliant. God, we don't need you. The Valley of Jezreel speaks for itself. We're powerful, we're protected, we have comfort, we have great wealth. (laughs) Look at our infrastructure. Look at our trade. (laughs) This is great, and we did it all without you. So what do we need you for? Now look at verse seven. And then there's this contrast. But, God says, I will have mercy on the house of Judah. So the north ain't got nothing for you. The south, I'll save you. I will have mercy for you. But God says, I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. In other words, I will not save Israel or uh, uh, Judah because they are powerful or because they can pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. I will save them on my own account. I'll do it. I don't need you to do it. Now, if you think about it, people who think to themselves, we don't really need God, that sounds a lot like today. There's a lot of people Maybe some of you sitting here who really honestly will give lip service to God, but deep down you don't need God. Why do you need God? You got pepper jack cheese in your fridge. You got ice cream in the freezer, and you got a Panda Express app on your phone. At any moment, if you're hungry, you can can have, you got food brought to you. What do you need God for to give you your daily bread? I got my phone. All I need is Wi-Fi. I don't need God. Or today, you have people who's like, man, I'm, we live in a land of comfort and safety. What do I need God for? I drive a car with 31 airbags or something like that. And I have a ring doorbell. 
I can see who's at my door. I can see who's stealing my packages. I can, you know, snoop on my neighbors. What do I need, what do I need God for to keep me safe? I mean, think about it. Even if you go to college and you don't like what the professor says or what other kids say, you can go to your safe place where you are no longer harmed by dangerous words. What do you need God for? Or if you think about it, like, if you're a powerful nation like America, I mean, like, why in the world would you need God? The government can do so much for you. The government can cut stimulus checks for you. Now you go buy the big screen TV that you've been wanting. You can own an AR-15. What do you need a government for? What do you need God for to protect you? You just mow people down. And think about it, if anyone, you know, like threatens us, look, we got drones that would just blow people to smithereens. What do we need God for? We kind of have it covered, don't we? I mean, we're safe, we're powerful, we're wealthy got food anytime I want, clothing. And so God gets pushed to the periphery. We don't need him. I mean, he's nice to have as a mascot, but not much more than that. And it's exactly that attitude and that mental kind of way of thinking that God says, no mercy for you. You don't get it. If you don't want me, you don't depend on me, you don't trust me, fine. Then you don't get me. I'm out of here. But God is gonna save Judah, but he's gonna save Judah in a miraculous way. Now, I don't wanna bore you with all the details of this, but later on, the king of Assyria named Sennacherib, he comes and attacks Jerusalem while King Hezekiah is ruling. And he comes and he intimidates the people and threatens them, and here's one of the things he says through a messenger who writes a letter. He says, do not listen to Hezekiah the king when he misleads you by saying the Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their lands out of my hand that Yahweh should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? You see what he's saying? He's accusing Yahweh of being powerless. He can't do anything. And he's telling Hezekiah and the people, you better not trust God. He's not trustworthy. I'm God. I'm gonna take you out. And there's nothing you can do about it. And the people are intimidated. So when Hezekiah receives this letter and this message, he, he reads it, and then he takes it to the house of the Lord, he spreads it, spreads it before the Lord, and he prays. And at the end of his prayer, he says this in verse 19, so now, O Lord God, save us, please. Save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. And this is why God is gonna have mercy for Judah is because they have not lost their dependency and trust in Yahweh. Hezekiah still shows that they are trusting God. God come through for us. And without reading the whole thing, 2 Kings chapter 19 ends where an angel of the Lord comes in the middle of the night while all the armies of Assyria are sleeping and strikes them dead. And they wake up in the morning seeing dead bodies everywhere and they run away. Because God said, it won't be by bows, it won't be by war, it won't be by swords, it won't be by horses or horsemen. I will save you. You won't save yourself. Judah understood that, but Israel didn't. And now we have the third child, verses eight and nine. So when she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son, and Yahweh said to Hosea, call his name, not my people. For you are not my people and I'm not your God. Again, what a crazy name. It's the idea of this child, (laughs) yeah, I want nothing to do with him. You're not mine, I don't know you, I disown you. Now, why was that the name? Well, God wants to portray that the people are receiving the covenant curse for their disobedience. Now, a covenant is a chosen relationship between two people, one greater than the other, in which there are binding promises made. And when God covenanted, had a binding promise to the people of Israel, he promised and swore that he will never leave them nor forsake them, and the people were to respond that they will never leave him nor forsake him. 
These, bind, these promises were binding. And what God does is he says, here's the covenant I'm making with you, and I'm laying before you, part of the stipulations of the covenant is I'm gonna bless you and give you life if you remain true to the covenant, but if you don't, I'm gonna curse you and you're gonna die. And so what we read in Deuteronomy 30, and you can read about Deuteronomy 30, the whole thing, because that, that's the covenant, cursing and bless, blessing. Moses says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that God has set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, so that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. In other words, the blessing and the life is you'll stay in the land, but if you disobey and you resist the covenant, you're gonna be kicked out of the land and you'll have no life, it'll be all curse. Now we come to understand this is about 730 BC or so is when Hosea takes place. And in about 10 years, 722 BC, Assyria comes and invades the northern kingdom and takes them out of their land, which tells us the people did not repent. The people did not submit to God. They chose death. They chose curse. Now what's interesting is the covenant blessings to the faithful are usually accompanied by this little slogan or this little phrase. And the little slogan or the little phrase is, God will be your God and you will be his people. So let me show you a couple texts where it comes in together, where God foreshadows the Mosaic covenant. In Exodus chapter six, he says, I will take you to be my people, Israel. And I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And you can see that covenant uh, playing out right here. I'll be God for you and you will be my people. And then we go on and we see this in Jeremiah 31, the promise of the new covenant which is fulfilled and established by Jesus Christ where the prophet says, behold the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them out of the, uh, out by, took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband. You see the marriage language here? Again, that spiritual adultery stuff. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And here's the slogan and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. It's God's kind of stamp of approval. So much so that when you look forward into the new heavens and new earth, the heavens, where we will dwell with God free of sin and all the effects of sin, here's what we see. The apostle John says he heard a voice from the throne of God saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Or in verse seven, the one who conquers, that is the one who maintains faith throughout life, they will have this heritage or reward. I will be his God and he will be my son. In other words, the blessings of the covenant is quite simply, you get God. You get God. And by having God, he has you. He's yours. You're his. That is what it means to have life and blessing. Not to have the stuff, but it's to have God. But if you choose, I don't want God, then you don't get the stuff either. It's all curse. It's all exile. It's all death. If you don't want a relationship with God, God is so generous, he will give you exactly that. And so if I ended the sermon here, you would all be very mad. This is so like heavy and like, oh, like, I'm never going to church again. I don't feel good. And so we arrive to verse 10 because if you remember Hosea 6, God wounds in order to bind. We have nine verses of wounding. You are sinful. You're gonna be judged. You are wretched. 
you are wicked. You disobey God. You hate God. You belittle God. You want nothing to do with God. Your life is filled with all kinds of sin. And for us to hear that, we don't like that. But the reality is we need to hear it. You are more terrible than you realize. First word of verse 10, yet. Even though you are disgusting and terrible and wretched, yet. In light of all this stuff, yet. The number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. In other words, what God is saying is, even though you deserve and will receive judgment and consequences, yet I will bless you. Wait, what? Yes, I will increase your number. The children of Israel who I said, I'm gonna take you out. You get no mercy, no forgiveness. I disowned you. I'm gonna multiply you. Wait, what? Do you feel the whiplash in that? God says, you're wretched, you don't deserve anything. And I'm gonna lavish everything on you. Because that is the way God enacts these covenants with people. So I'm gonna walk you through the covenants of the Old Testament. Starting with Adam, you'll see the multiplication and fruitfulness as a part of the covenant. Where God says to, Abraham, or says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So there's the covenant with Adam, God's blessing of multiplication and fruitfulness. And then we go to the covenant with Noah. God blesses Noah and his sons and he says to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And then there's the covenant with Abraham where God says to Abraham, who's 99 years old, already got one foot in the grave, I am God Almighty, walk before me, be blameless so that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. And then we see in Leviticus 26, the Mosaic covenant, where God says, I will turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply you and will confirm my covenant with you. And then the promise of the new covenant that the host of heaven cannot be numbered and the sands of the sea cannot be measured. So I will multiply the offspring of David, my servant, and the Levitical priests who minister to me. In other words, although the only thing you deserve is judgment and punishment, I am the God of mercy and grace, and though you deserve nothing, I'm gonna give you everything. Because though you broke my covenant, God says, I will keep my covenant. My covenant is this, I am always for you. And I will keep my covenant by either blessing you because of your obedience, or I will curse you because of your disobedience, but either way, I'm not giving up on the covenant. And so he says, you are the object of judgment, and yet, in my mercy and in my grace and because of my steadfast love for you, I will multiply you and bless you and if you're not scandalized by that, you're not paying attention. That's a scandal. In other words, these people don't deserve that kind of treatment to be blessed and multiplied and fruitful. No, they don't. And yet God lavishes mercy and grace on them anyway. That is grace. You and I don't deserve anything but judgment because of our sin, and yet God in his infinite mercy and grace because of the great love with which he has loved us says, even though you're as wretched and worse than you even realize, yet I am for you and I will bless you and I will grant to you all that I promise, but you don't deserve a lick of it. I will do it for you because Jesus has purchased all of those blessings on your behalf. You get it through him and by no other means. Are you tracking with me, church? This is unbelievable. And that's why the gospel has to be preached in this way, which is like sin and yet God in his mercy. Because if you only have a God of mercy with no sin, then you don't see God as all that great. Yeah, it's mercy, man, yeah, whatever. I'm not that bad anyways. But if you only preach sin and you never get to mercy, then you're gonna feel terrible about yourself. And so instead, feel terrible about yourself 
and then run to God and realize how much God loves you and how much he has done to save you, forgive you, give you mercy and grace and make you his own. And it will change everything about your life. And we go on and say, in the place where it, is, it was said to them, you are not my people. Remember, God disowns them. In that very place, it's gonna be said of these very same people, you are children of the living God. This is not a mere restoration where God says, look, you know, I, I disowned you, but I'm gonna reinstate you to the exact level that you once were. This is God saying, you don't deserve anything, I disown you, and now I'm going to exalt you to an even higher and greater place. Wait, what? You're gonna do that? Yeah, because you're gonna go, not merely just my people, but you're gonna become my children. You who deserve nothing but God's condemnation and judgment, you will become adopted children and recipients, co-heirs of all the unblushing promises of God to do you good and give you life eternal. Wait, what? This is intense. Now, how does this come about? The Apostle Paul says, is in the same way we also, when we were children, that is, when we were immature, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. You and I have bought into a lie that the greatest goal of life is the accumulation of stuff. To be powerful and beautiful and well-liked, that is the meaning of life. No, that's the elementary principles of the world. That's bondage because you will never be enough. You'll never be beautiful enough. You will never be rich enough. You will never be strong enough, powerful enough, healthy enough, fit enough. And you will always feel lacking. But when we were in the throes of sin and bondage to all these elementary principles, when the fullness of time had come at the exact right moment, God sent forth his son, Jesus Christ who was born from Eve, or the woman, born under the law, that is of the old covenant, and the whole reason why God sent forth his son is to redeem us, those of us who are under the penalty of sin, the curse of the law. And why does he redeem us? It's so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, and we crying, Abba, Father where once we cowered in fear of God because God sent Jesus, his son, to redeem us and to rescue us from our sin and from our selfishness and self-reliance and our belittling of God and hatred of God. Because Jesus came to do that, we now have the right to become children of God with the indwelling Holy Spirit that gives us confidence and boldness to always go to God without ever thinking or feeling as though we may be rejected. You will never be rejected if you come to God through Christ. There's no condemnation for you. You are loved. You are welcomed. You are secure. You are an object of mercy and of great grace. So come. And in verse 11, you see this great reversal. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and they shall appoint for themselves one head. So remember the the north country of Israel, the south country of Judah, they were at odds with each other and a lot of people prayed for reunification. And one day they will be reunited, but not only will they be reunited, but they will be reunited under one leader, one head. What's amazing about this is if you know your biblical history, you understand the northern kingdom was attacked and conquered in 722 BC by Assyria and they were exiled. And what, a, what Assyria did was bring other conquered peoples into the northern area to intermingle and intermarry and to have various religious practices. And the people who were intermingling, they became known as the Samaritans. And as you well know in the New Testament, the Jews and the Samaritans, they didn't get along. And so here is this idea that one day Jews and Samaritans, and even beyond that, Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles will all gather together under one singular leader. And knowing our Bibles, we know that this is under the leadership of Jesus, 
It's the gathering of all people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people group. Where the Apostle Paul writes this in Romans 9, what if God, desiring to show his wrath to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? In order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has called, us Jews, Not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. In other words, God has called people, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles, to be vessels of his mercy, to be people saved from their sin. And what Paul does is, this is his proof from Hosea. Those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you're not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. So the reversal. First you have Jezreel, punishment. There's gonna be blood shed for your sins. Not only that, but I'm not gonna forgive you or give you mercy, I'm disowning you. And you see the exact reversal starting in verse 10. I will no longer disown you. I'm gonna have you as my own. You're gonna be my child. And indeed, I will forgive you. And that's all because there will be bloodshed. There will be atonement for sins, but I won't take it from you. I've sent my son Jesus to be the one who sheds the blood on your behalf. So here's what we learn. Peoples from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people group will come into the people of God called the church. And in verse 18 of Colossians 1, Jesus will be the head of the church. He will be the head of these vast peoples, Jews and Samaritans and Gentiles. And in verse 20, the peace, because you know the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, they didn't get along. Samaritans and Jews, they didn't get along. Jews and Gentiles, they didn't get along. In our country, we know People of different ethnicities don't get along. Different political stripes don't get along. But it's the blood of Jesus that makes peace. It's the blood of Jesus. And so we end our little section at the end of verse 11. And they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. That phrase, go up from the land, describes the exodus. That's what we read in Micah 5, that God brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. In other words, there's coming a day, the day of Jezreel, where the people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people group will come under the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will be brought up out of the land of slavery, of sin and darkness. And they will be brought to a new land, the kingdom of God's one and only beloved son in whom they have redemption, forgiveness, reconciliation, where there is peace, true, abiding, lasting peace. All this calls to mind, brothers and sisters, the word of Jezreel is God sows. We do not sow this redemption. We do not work for this redemption. It is God who sows it. It is God who makes it possible. It is the God who does it. Notice Jezreel is a place of blood. It's the place where God is gonna execute judgment. He says, unless there's the uh, shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Well, there's coming a day of Jezreel, he says, where there will be bloodshed. There will be atonement for sins. There will be forgiveness. And what I would say to you is this. That is the best description of the cross of Jesus Christ. For it is the cross of Jesus Christ which is the true Jezreel. It's the true place of blood in which both judgment and atonement mingle. It's the place where because of the shed blood there, there is the hope of forgiveness. And so the place of Jezreel, not only a place of blood, but an object of God's judgment, Jesus himself is the truer Jezreel, for he himself took upon himself our sin and judgment of God. And Jesus also is the truer day of Jezreel, which means this, it is in him, through his shed blood, his life, death, and resurrection, that we experience the covenant blessings 
that God is for us and not against us. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and our sins have been atoned for and we've been washed new by the blood of Jesus. All of this is foreshadowed in Hosea. In Christ, brothers and sisters, in Christ, we become the children of God. We are redeemed from our sins. We are reconciled to God and each other. We experience peace for what God has done for us in atoning for our sins through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And he has confirmed this in a new covenant which was enacted by the blood of Jesus that we celebrate and remember every time we take communion. That God is building a people and we are part of that by faith. We don't deserve it. There's nothing about us that makes God do this for us. He did it of his sheer grace and mercy. You have sinned greatly and yet God's mercy is greater and he wants you as his own. And if these things are true, that means you and I have a brand new identity. We are no longer the obstinate, disobedient, rebellious people who hate God. We have a new identity. And as Jim read, we're gonna close with this text. This is what it means for us. Church, you who have repented of your sins and believed in Jesus, you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a people for God's possession. Why? It's so that we may proclaim the excellencies of God who has called us out of the darkness of sin, out of the land of bondage. And he's called us into the marvelous light of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. You see, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy through the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Hosea is good. And so, brothers and sisters, we're gonna marvel and revel in the glory of God in his mercy and grace for wayward sinners like us because our God relentlessly pursues his people for he loves them with an inexhaustible and unquenchable fervor. He wants you. So, Father, we pray. We pray, O oh Lord, as we close our service that you would work in each of us to know that you are the God who sees all of our sin. You know our secrets and the darkness in our own hearts, and yet you love us. You have mercy for us and grace for us because the Lord Jesus Christ is the true Jezreel. The cross of Christ is the place in which the shed blood of Jesus washes us from our sin, cleanses us and makes us new. It is through the shed blood of Christ that we have forgiveness. It is through the new covenant enacted in Jesus' blood that we are a people and you are our God. And as we close our service, I pray that you help us to sing to one another as we reflect all that you have done. You have done it. And to you be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing that. We celebrate what God has done.
sacrifice we're one Sinners unified by grace We're bound together And look what God has done By His Spirit through His Son By the power of His hand He is sending Apostle Paul, he says this at the end of 2 Corinthians, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And as we've just heard from 1 Peter chapter 2, may we go out and be the church who proclaims the excellencies of God who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So church, we are sent. Let us go for his glory and our joy. We'll see you next week. Love you guys. slumber when the